This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 2nd, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain how the Ledge Finance Division's biased and inaccurate treatment of the PFD under current law is now crossing over into the media. Second, we discuss the significant impact of the coronavirus-induced economic downturn on state revenues. And third, we discuss what many are badly missing as they think about whether to sign the recall Dunleavy petition. And now, let's join Michael. We'll kick things off with number one. We were just talking about it, this uh, this false narrative uh, from, uh, from the legislature and from politicians in general about the PFD, uh, about how they're here to protect it. Uh, of course, they, they don't finish that sentence, which is protected from us, that, you know, they should have it for their own revenue resources. The ADN had this piece about it the other day talking about how there's they're struggling to make any kind of cuts they just couldn't possibly find I mean they made a whole whopping less than one percent cut last year and uh you know the, but they they just couldn't possibly find any more and there's no talk of new revenues so what are we going to do yeah th- that article uh was a good one in the sense that it was a fairly broad sweep of of what's going on in the legislature what people are saying um, and you know how people are reacting to the to the current budget situation. It was a good update uh, from various legislators uh, about their about their positions on it. But there was one thing early on in the article that just really you know triggered me. Um, it was a statement that that essentially uh, adopts a line that Senator von Imhoff and others have used, which is that uh, if we do, to, in order to pay the PFD, uh, we would need major tax increases. That major tax increases, uh, that, that in order to, to, to fund the PFD, uh, major tax increases are necessary to, uh, to pay for the traditional permanent fund dividend. And that, that triggers me because it's just flat wrong. It is, it is a, um, a misinterpretation, an intentional misinterpretation, uh, of the way the statutes uh, set up uh, that, that Senator Inhoff, von Imhoff uses and others use uh, in order to try to prejudice uh, uh, the debate on the PFD. Basically what they're saying uh, is that uh, SB 26 set up this conflict, um, and the conflict is that, uh, that you can't pay both the PFD and uh, the necessary funds uh, needed to uh, plug the, the fiscal gap uh, over in the budget. You can't take both of those out of the PFD. And so their, their quick interpretation, they quickly go from that to say, well, you know, we got to take the funds for the budget first, and so the PFD is, is surplus. Um, and in order to pay the full PFD, in order to have the revenues necessary to pay the full, full PFD, we would need taxes uh, or some other revenue source to be able to, uh, to, to fund that. That is that is just the the exact reverse of how the statute reads. The statutes read, and and the and the legislature left these statutes, the key statutes, in place when it enacted SB 26. The statute reads that uh, first of all, SB 26 uh, re- restricts the amount of money you can take from 
the earnings reserve uh, fund. And, right. and frankly, I think SB, I think that the draw rate is wrong, but the but the principle behind SB twenty six to restrict what any given generation can take uh, from the from the earnings uh, earnings reserve is the right approach. Right. But then the statute reads. Uh, the statutes read, from that draw that you've taken from the permanent fund under SB 26, the way the statutes read is the first uh, amount of that goes to pay the permanent fund dividend. There, there is no conflict. The, statute, the statutes it, they themselves don't say you've got to pay the permanent fund dividend and you've got to pay the deficit in government. The second part isn't in the statutes. It's only the first part. The first part says you've got to pay the permanent fund dividend. And so the statute, applying the statute, you, you make this draw from, from the earnings reserve account. You pay the permanent fund dividend. That's what the statute says. This legislature didn't change that statute in SB 26. And then you've got a remaining amount after you deduct uh, the permanent fund, the amount for the permanent fund dividend, then you've got a remaining amount that the legislature can appropriate uh, over for, for whatever purpose it wants. Um, and, and what it should be used for is to fill the fiscal gap over on the other side. That means that means that the problem is that that the that the leftover amount, the remaining amount, isn't enough to fill the fiscal gap. And so you've got to have new revenues to fill to fill that deficit. Um, and and that's what taxes would go for. Taxes would go to help pay for that deficit over on the spending side. They don't go to pay for under the statutes. They don't go to the permanent fund dividend. That's already been paid for under the statutes out of the SB 26 draw, out of the earnings reserve account, over, well, done, well, fully funded. There, there's one problem with that, Brad, and that, of course, is – uh, they, they're they, assuming that they read the statute or care about the statute, right? I mean, they've shown how many times have they shown so far that they just don't even care about the statute. So as it's written, it's how they interpret it. It's not, you know, it's not really how it's written. It's how they interpret it is, is what matters at this point, right? But it should matter. It should matter to the ADM. It should matter to the media. And it should matter, matter to legislative finance, who also does this backward interpretation. Facts matter. I mean, so what they're setting up is 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 the argument that, oh, we would need to raise taxes to to fund the permanent fund dividend. Nobody wants taxes, uh, and so we and so we're going to cut the permanent fund dividend. That what really what the statute really provides, and what ADN should be reporting, and what legislative finance, who's, who claims to be nonpartisan and objective about all this, um, uh, should be saying is, permanent fund dividends fun, financed. We, that's what the statutes provide. That, you passed it, legislature. That's what the statutes provide. If you want, if you want to keep spending and you want to fund that spending and you want to close the fiscal gap, you need more revenues to do that. You need taxes to fund to fund that that additional spending. And here's the deal, Michael. I mean, here, here's why this is important. Alaskans who play, who say they don't want to be taxed would say, well, we don't want to be taxed. Cut spending. Because that's that's what you would use the revenue for. That's what the revenue under the statute is supposed to be used for. It's supposed to cut spending. So the legislature doesn't want to do that, and and some in the legislature, the the the, the leadership doesn't want to do that. And so they invert the statute and say, well, you know, we would have to have taxes in order to pay the PFD. It's just it's it's a backwards interpret and intentionally misinterpretation, backwards interpretation of the statute in order to put the burden, in order to be able to argue that, that taxes would be necessary to pay for the PFD. And yeah, legisl if legislators want to go about go around lying about what the statutes say and about, and, and about how they've constructed the statutes, okay, fine, let, the, let, let them lie. But, but the but legislative finance division, which claims to be nonpartisan objective, just there to tell the truth, and the ADN and media uh, uh, buying into that story and saying, well, you'd have to raise taxes in order to pay the PFD under, under the statutes. That's what the law says. That just that, – that triggers me because that's you're, – you're, you're, you're intentionally misstating, you're intentionally misusing the statutes in order to shift the burden of taxes onto the PFD as opposed to where the statutes put it. Put it which is taxes would be necessary uh, to pay for spending. 
<laughs> I just say Harold in the chat room says, you mean Natasha lied about the PFD? I mean, come on. This is this is exactly the, the whole point. They know exactly what they're doing. That's why I said words matter. They know exactly what they're doing. They're sacrificing the private sector on the altar of the public sector, and they've been doing it for years. And whether it's for the reasons on the left of supporting or propping up some kind of social safety network or welfare program, or whether it's those on the right who are propping up, you know, kind of corporate cronyism and government uh, contracts and spending, that's what it's all about. In the long run, it must survive over everything else. I, I don't. I don't. I don't disagree that that legislature legislators will lie. What's really bothering me is that legislative finance division, the supposed impartial, non you know nonpartisan, just the facts, ma'am, uh, agency uh, division of the government, and now the the media are lying. James Brooks, uh, who wrote the ADN article, had done a really good job um, along the way. Now sometimes he fudged the words. So you couldn't really tell what he was saying, uh, but, but but he'd done a really good job, sort of sort of doing a just the facts, ma'am, version uh, of these of these issues. This article, uh, where he talks about the permanent uh, taxes being necessary to pay the permanent fund dividend, this article crosses the line to me, and 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 is now repeating a mantra that is just factually wrong. It, it is it is not what the statutes say. And and for for the media to be doing that, for Ledge Finance to be doing that has 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 bothered me for a long time. But for the media to be doing that, uh, I think is is crossing the line. I mean, the media has a responsibility to the public, right? We we give them First Amendment protections. We give them all sorts of protections. They have antitrust protections um, it, because they're supposed to be doing a public service and and reporting. Uh, 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 information accurately. Uh, this 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 article crossed the line um, and and is now buying into this distortion of the statute uh, that some legislators are are throwing out there, and that and that's that's just wrong. I mean, when you can't trust your media, I, I know uh, people people say Shocking. we can't trust the media, but 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 we've been doing a they've been doing a good job up until this point and crossing and they've just crossed the line. Uh, so that's number one. <laughs> Brad is Brad has discovered fake news. Uh, that's number one. <laughs> but uh, I mean, yeah, I'm with you, Brad. I mean, uh, overall, he's done a pretty good job. You could usually read between the lines of his biases, but he's he's bought this one hook, line, and sinker uh, all the way through. And I don't know if it's naivete or just kind of camaraderie or you know, kind of an alignment of, of philosophies or what. But uh, it is definitely troubling. Um, and again, this is why we need to read between the lines and kind of take a look at what's actually what the law says and what's being said. And this has been part of the problem, Brad, is that there's really no, uh, I guess, deeper uh, analysis of what's going on. It's like the the journalists take the press releases that they get from the legislature, they reword them, and then they print them as news. There's really there hasn't been a whole lot of deeper digging on many of these uh, issues throughout the as we go forward. Maybe maybe my 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 problem here is is my disappointment in James Brooks. I mean, I, I have I have I have read his stuff. Um, I have I have talked about his stuff to others. I've talked about it on the program here, and I I think it's been a really good source of solid reporting, fair reporting, accurate reporting about what's going on uh, in the legislature. Um, and and. This article is is another example of good solid reporting in the sense that he touched a lot of bases and he he got a lot of perspectives uh, on on the issues, but 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 what really bothers me is it's a departure from what I've perceived him to be to be doing in the past uh, in terms of fair reporting uh, on the PFD issue. It's a departure by by crossing the line in my view. And and saying that you you need to raise taxes to, to to fund the PFD. That is not what the statutes say. And there's nothing there's nothing in his article uh, that takes the time to explain uh, uh, that or or explain you know uh, uh, that he's that he's repeating what Natasha says. It's just it's just a, a straight statement of fact early in the article, and that's it's wrong. You're set, you're setting the wrong. So what are you doing to your readers? You're setting the wrong perception 
uh, in their mind. They're thinking, oh, well, we can't, you know, we'd have to raise taxes to pay the PFD. No, the PFD's already paid for. Under the statutes, the legislature has passed. The PFD is already paid for. They did not override the PFD statute um, in, in, in SB 26. They left it alone because they knew they couldn't change it. So it sits there equal to any other statute they've passed, um, and, and it, it has the effect of, as I said, it has the effect of taking the, the first draw on the earnings reserve account and setting that aside for the PFD. If you want additional money um, uh, in order to fund government more than what is left over after you deduct the PFD, you need to get it from another source. They've been getting it from taxing the PFD, but, but it's taxes. You have to tax something in order to, to have that additional revenue. And, and it just, it, I mean, James has been so good about, 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 you know, not crossing that line that it just really bothers me that now that he's crossed the line, because now, I mean, so what else is he tilting, right? I mean, that the perception becomes, what else are you, are you tilting out there if you're willing to tilt this line? And uh, and I think that's exactly it. If you're willing to scrub the line on this one, that really becomes the kind of the the, the bigger question. What else are you willing to swallow the pablum on, uh, or pass the you know pass the you know pass off as news if that is uh, if that's uh, if that's the question. Uh, you know this whole and the whole undertone of this article, Brad, is what really got me was that there's just no possible. I mean, they just breeze right over the fact. That literally, when it was all said and done, they had a fifty-two million dollar budget cut and a five billion dollar plus budget. Uh, that I mean, they just couldn't possibly find one more thing to cut out there. That they just that that was just almost like a throwaway paragraph in that whole article. No other things to cut. Let's move on. And and, and I just I mean, just from a, a mathematical standpoint, find that if you can't cut, uh, you know, more than one percent out of a budget, there's obviously something wrong. Yeah, well, e- exactly right. But there's no incentive. There's no incentive on the part of the top twenty percent to cut, right? I mean, they they don't want to use any political uh, uh, power that they have, or any political goodwill they have, or any political capital they have to cut, uh, because because that would result in you know people starting to look at them, uh, the top twenty percent, to pay for uh, to contribute a, a portion of it. Um, so they don't want they don't want to you know be involved in cutting. Uh, they they've got a good deal uh, as long as I mean there are a lot the the alliance in the house is as long as we have all this spending you guys won't come after us we'll take it out of the PFD we'll take it out of out of middle and lower income Alaska families um, and so there's really there's no incentive to cut and there's not going to be an incentive to cut uh, until you have all Alaskans <laughs> right. uh, involved in paying a, a share of it. Number two, we're coming up on the break here, so I want to give a tease for number two. Stock market lost uh, a bunch of money. The permanent fund, $2.8 billion in value uh, in uh, in just a couple days trading. Uh, and, of course, the, the coronavirus fears are not over yet, and, and, and that, of course, has a ripple effect as well with oil uh, with oil demand and things like that, give us a quick thumbnail of uh, the number two, which is the impact on the Alaska economy, and then we'll dive into it on the other side. Uh, Michael, the, the the much bigger impact on the economy is the drop in oil prices, and I and I can explain why the drop in the permanent fund uh, uh, value is is not immaterial, uh, but it sort of gets washed out uh, in the in the long run. What's really significant. Uh, is the drop in oil prices. Well, before we went to break, we teased out number two, which has to do with uh, the fiscal crunch going on across the country, the stock market drop, the $2.8 billion in loss of the permanent fund, but more importantly, the demand for oil, which has dropped because of the coronavirus uh, and the lack of demand. I mean, China is pretty much in a, in a, in a, in a flight you know, holding pattern right now. Uh, of course, airlines now feeling the pinch as well. Goods not moving. That's a lot of oil that's not being used, Brad, which uh, is definitely not good for the economy uh, of Alaska. No, Michael, uh, it's not. And it has a much more direct impact on our current state fiscal situation than, frankly, the drop in the stock, mar- stock market is. The way, the way we set up draws from the, from the permanent fund, from the permanent fund earnings reserve, we average the stock market value over the preceding five years and take, take a percent of that. 
used to be 5.25%. Going forward, it'll be 5%. Um, and, and so any particular drop in the stock, mar- stock market um, uh, would show up in, in subsequent years um, and would, would be averaged out with, with high stock market values. So any days or any periods, uh, a particular drop is not going to, is not going to have an immediate impact on Alaskans. It'll show up over time and it'll be washed out with, a with, a, with good periods, uh, from the stock market. On the other hand, oil has drops in oil price have an immediate impact. Uh, we, uh, in, instead of averaging oil prices over time, we just take whatever the oil revenues are. We, we base our budget on, on whatever we think the oil revenues are going to be uh, for that year. And if oil revenues happen to go up during the year, then we've got surplus. If oil revenues go down during that year, uh, then we've got a, a deficit in that year. Um, and that's what we're confronting with, uh, with the drop in oil prices. Oil prices, um, uh, the, the way the legislature had uh, uh, viewed oil prices in uh, uh, in the fall revenue sources book, which was published in December, was they expected oil prices to average out at around sixty four dollars a barrel uh, over the remainder of the year, from December to uh, to the following to this coming uh, June thirtieth, uh, average out at sixty four dollars. Um, and oil prices up until this uh, particular crisis were doing okay. Uh, Alaska A and S was getting sort of a of a of a premium over Brent. Brent prices were staying in the high, in the in the low 60s, low and middle 60s, which meant the Alaska price was plus or minus right around uh, that uh, that that projection price. But what's happened with uh, with the coronavirus uh, impact is that oil prices have plummeted. Uh, they were down below 50 uh, at the close of of last week. Alaska prices were down below 50 at the close of last week. Uh, the imp- the the for reasons I could explain if I had time, the the coronavirus also has the the, the problems with with China and Japan also have had a, a, the impact of reversing the Alaska premium to Brent. So now we have a discount to Brent. We have a a, a negative to Brent. Um, and and the, between the plunge in oil prices and the reversal of that premium, uh, the Alaska prices are now below fifty dollars. So that has an immediate impact on the FY20 budget. We, we've talked about the FY20 budget being, you know, two hundred and some odd million uh, in deficit, uh, uh, or, 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 and and we and we had a CBR draw to to be able to uh, offset that. The price, the, the this plunge in prices means FY20 revenues are going to be even lower than we had projected, which means we are likely going to end up with an even higher CBR draw in order to balance the FY20 budget uh, by the time all is said and done. Um, and that means we'll have a lower CBR, a lower CBR balance going into FY21. We'll see the effects of this when uh, when when revenue comes out. The Department of Revenue comes out with their with their spring revenue forecast uh, next month, um, and we'll we'll see the impact of that. But it's but it's going to result in significantly low, materially lower uh, FY20 revenues um, uh, uh, in, by. For, for this year, a bigger deficit, and thus the need for yet another CBR draw to cover that deficit. And importantly, it's 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 going to result in a lower FY21, uh, the coming fiscal year uh, revenue forecast, because oil prices are down not only currently, but the but the futures market, which is what we base uh, oil revenue projections on anymore, uh, the futures prices are also down significantly. We. Revenue has the current revenue forecast for FY21 is based on $59 oil. Um, we're back above 50, uh, but barely, and so that means a significant drop in oil revenues, not only for this year but also for FY21. All of that, all of that, Michael translates into um, uh, even more budget stress than we were already under. Uh, if oil revenues stay down. Uh, and or if oil prices stay down and oil revenues stay down, that means we've got even less money to deal with uh, the FY21 budget than we thought we were going to have uh, when this when this session started, and it and it will mean even more stress on, given this legislature making PFD cuts, deeper PFD cuts uh, to pay for 
uh, that continued spending because we won't have the oil revenues that we thought we were going to have uh, uh, to uh, uh, to help pay for that spending. Well, and I think that's the big thing that most people don't understand that if we do fall short on the revenue or the you know on the projections that that money comes straight out of the CBR and they assume, well, we've got just almost $2 billion in there, but it won't be. And if Governor Dunleavy's $1.5 billion draw strains it even more, I mean, you know, I mean, hypothetically, if things continue to decline, we get more coronavirus outbreaks, you know, it slows things down even more. We get more isolationist in, in what we're doing and we, you know, we kind of hunker down. Uh, those prices, because of the glut, I mean, the demand would would fall, you know, precipitously, and we could see to where we barely have one point five billion dollars in the CBR. And if we dry, drain it dry, there's not a lot of buckets left to go to. Yeah, and I guess my I guess the the the, the point here is that we're going to be draining the CBR more for FY twenty because of this drop in oil prices than uh, than we had previously anticipated. So there's going to be less CBR going into FY21. There's going to be less oil revenue projected in FY21 because of this drop in oil prices. And so an even greater uh, draw on the CBR. I, we, we may not, I mean, we've talked about we won't have a CBR after next year if we, if we, if we use the CBR to, uh, to fund this budget gap. The, the, the concern is that we may not have enough CBR for next year um, uh, after we drain drain it additionally for FY20, right? And after you're after you're looking at the uh, at the FY21 uh, oil revenues as a result of lower FY21 oil revenues as a result of this drop. Uh, we're running out of time here. About three and a half minutes. We get to number three. Number three is what many are overlooking about the recall effort. What people aren't really thinking about the unintended consequences. We've talked about this on the show before, but but I, I, it's important to keep it in people's minds. And that is what this election, what the recall election really is, is about whether we continue with Mike, Mike Dunleavy or we elect Kevin Meyer as governor. And Kevin Meyer, I mean, it's Kevin Meyer has a track record of cutting the PFD, clearly cutting the PFD. He was among those in 2016, even before Bill Walker um, uh, uh, vetoed the PFD. Kevin Meyer was among those that passed a bill that would have cut the PFD in in half, would have well more than half, would have cut it down to 25 percent of the uh, of the uh, earnings reserve draw, and and put a cap on it. He would have put a cap on it for three years. That bill would have put a cap on the PFD at a thousand dollars for three years, significantly below uh, what the PFD uh, what the statute otherwise provides for, and significantly below what the legislature's otherwise authorized uh, uh, for the last three years. So Kevin, Kevin Meyer was one of the first PFD cutters. And, and when I talk to people who are, you know, pro uh, for the recall, I say, you, re- you realize what you're, but, but they also want the PFD. I, I, you realize what you're doing is you're cutting your own throat because Kevin Meyer will be among the first to help uh, permanently reduce the PFD. And, and the reaction I sometimes get is, oh, well, re- we'll recall him too. No, you won't. <laughs> That, that's so just it, we're just going to recall him. It's just like you know we'll just like changing socks. Yeah, and it's I, and and so people are sitting there going, people are thinking, well, I want to get rid of Dunley because of all these bad things that he's done, but what they're not thinking about is is what happens after you recall Dunleavy. And electing Kevin Meyer governor is a significantly different governor on fiscal matters than Mike Dunleavy's been. Kevin Meyer was was part of those. Who built up spending during the during the late 2000s and the early 20 teens? Uh, he was co-chair of House Finance and then co-chair of Senate Finance and then Senate President. As I say, he was among the first to vote for uh, 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 deep PFD cuts, permanent PFD cuts, even before Bill Walker right. uh, did his did his first veto. And it's amazing to me, Brad, that people just think, "Oh, well, we don't like that. We'll just change." I mean, this is unprecedented. That I mean, there's. You know, recalls have very rarely ever been used, and very rarely when they've been used have they been successful. Uh, and so this idea of, well, we don't like Dunleavy, but we'll get Meyer, and then, then we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll vote him out as well. Uh, I mean, this is, this is kind of, uh, you know, quite honestly, this is like mob rule run amok is what, kind of what it is. I mean, this is, you know, they're, they're kind of tipping the idea of a, uh, you know, a democratically elected constitutional, uh, uh, you know, principle on its head with this whole idea of just recall, recall, recall. This is the kind of the resist movement writ large. 
Yeah, it's a uh, sort of the French Revolution, right? I mean, it's it's uh, we we deposed the king, but but now we don't like the first uh, first leader we we installed, so we'll send him to the guillotine. And now we don't like the second leader. I, th- that's not that's not how we're going to be able to do this. This this is a permanent change. Um, uh, from from Mike Dunleavy to Kevin Meyer, you're not going to be able to to get rid of Kevin Meyer, and Kevin Meyer it will be a significantly different governor uh, than Mike Dunleavy's been. Yes, we're frustrated with 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 Governor Dunleavy in terms of he hasn't cut enough, uh, and in terms of he hasn't been able to position uh, uh, getting a full PFD. Uh, but some of that's his fault. Some of that's not his fault. But but he continues to try. Kevin Meyer wouldn't even try. Kevin Meyer never spent, met a spending program he didn't like during his terms as, as House Finance and Senate Finance uh, co-chair. And Kevin Meyer was among the first, uh, even before Bill Walker vetoed, Kevin Meyer was among the first uh, to, uh, to vote permanently uh, to cut the PFD. That is, that is an entirely different governor uh, that on fiscal issues than you've got uh, with Mike Dunleavy. And as frustrated as some people might be with, with Dunleavy, um, you, you haven't seen anything yet uh, if you replace Dunleavy with Kevin Meyer. So I, when, when, when I talk to people about, uh, and, and I would encourage listeners, when, when they talk to people about recall and, and you're talking to a person who says, yeah, I think you know recall might not be bad. I'm frustrated with Dunleavy about this, or I'm, I'm troubled by this, or he's done that. Um, I, I, I would I talk to people and say, well, Kevin Meyer would be worse, and and the reaction is the reaction generally is Kevin Meyer. I mean, what's that got to do with it? I'm, I'm recalling Dunleavy. I don't I don't care about Kevin Meyer. Kevin Meyer will be your governor, folks, if you recall Dunleavy, and you're not you're not getting what you may think you're getting. You're uh, on fiscal issues. You're getting something significantly worse. So uh, that's a conversation that Alaskans need to have with each other. You don't stop the conversation at whether or not to recall Dunleavy. You 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 continue the conversation on to what happens if you do recall the governor, and it's worse than we than we've got now. Uh, have you been watching some of the reporting on the recall itself? Uh, I mean, I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, Suzanne Downing she put operatives at all the major locations that uh, you know had the recall effort, and it didn't seem like. Uh, you know, maybe this pause has given, uh, you know, given some of that traction and momentum away on top of the fact that the governor didn't propose any cuts this year, which I think was kind of part of the political you know, plan as to not put his head above the crowd to catch the tomato, so to speak. Do you think that it is uh, still has the same amount of steam or do you think it's running out of steam? What, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I, I don't it doesn't have the same amount of steam. For example, the first weekend after they started the petition drive to, to initiate a recall process, uh, the, the the recall people were all about you know reporting how many numbers had signed, how you know posting pictures of how dramatic the the the, the petition process was and how how successful it had been. You see none of that uh, out of out of this first weekend. So I think I think that's an admission. Frankly, it's not going as strong. Uh, as it did the first time, and not strong enough for them to be able to promote it as as gaining a lot of momentum. But it's a it's a fairly long process, as we saw with the with the oil tax initiative. Uh, a lot of people will sign stuff, <laughs> um, uh, and you you know you put professional uh, uh, signature gatherers out in place. They know what they're doing, and and they can they can gather. They may not have had that first weekend, but but you can't. They may not have had the momentum out of that first weekend, but you can't let your guard down and say, well, it's just not going to work. They're not going to be able to get the signatures then. There's a long way to go in this process, and, and, and we need to keep talking about it. And we need, in my view, we need to keep talking about what, what you do if you recall Dunleavy, what the impact is if you recall Dunleavy and installing Kevin Meyer as governor. Brad, uh, one, final, uh, one final question here as we get ready to wrap up less than two minutes here. What uh, what should we be watching out for this next this next week? What should we be paying attention to? Um, I think uh, over on the Senate side, uh, they're going to try. Uh, uh, they'll have the budget in front of them. There's going to be a lot of discussion about the PFD. Over on the House side, they may start working on a permanent PFD cut bill um, uh, after they did this resolution last week. Um, and so I think I, you need to. We need to keep paying attention to what both bodies are doing with respect to the PFD and trying to position themselves to make a, to make a permanent PFD cut. 
All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, you can find the link up at the top of the page there to both Brad and to the page for uh, a, uh, ASB. Uh, you could take a look up there and, and just kind of follow along, and he'll be posting good stuff all weekend. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.